important to say that this is one of the a very well run and very well structured and quite an established kind of graduate conference run from this part of the world. And the student coordinators have always been doing an excellent job uh, uh, you know, coordinating and bringing people together and also you know, identifying the most pertinent themes, which are uh, very relevant to the times. And I take this time to congratulate the organizers and also, you know, all of you who have been part of this in various capacities. And I, I'm sure that you've been having a wonderful uh, academic experience over here, learning from each other, and I myself look forward to learning from the papers, the wonderful papers, the abstracts of which I have read. Um, I think we can start in the order that Garima uh, mentioned, and I will chip in at the end, and we will see if there is some time that we have for uh, discussion. Uh, so I request the first presenter to come forward, and I, uh, as mentioned, if you need the rights to share your presentation, uh, I guess there will be a team to take care of that as well. So, can I please request the first presenter, Abhirami A, to start with your presentation? Hello, ma'am. Uh, I don't. I don't need a PPT. I'll be talking. So wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. you 15, yeah, you have fifteen minutes. Yeah, all the way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, respected moderator, organizing team, and my fellow presenters, I'm Abhirami A, a research scholar in English from IIT Kanpur. Today, I would like to present a paper titled Semiotics of Hope Amidst the Pandemic in Music Videos, an analysis of Maroon 5's Nobody's Love and Pitbull's I Believe That We Will Win. As we know, we are in the midst of a pandemic that is slowly becoming an epidemic and the world has been struggling to stay put and hopeful for survival. So we're going through collective trauma and the pandemic has profound implications on our minds. So staying motivated is pertinent and um, Pop culture is adapting to cater to the crisis. Uh, so music, which is a very significant part of our culture, stories and lives uh, can uplift our spirits as we tackle with the novel changes of the modern world and our existence. So Nobody's Love by the band Maroon 5 is featured in the album Jordi that was uh, released on July 24, 2020. And I Believe That We Will Win is a single by Pitbull, uh, which was released on 30 April 2020. So Pitbull is the stage name of an uh, American rapper named Armando Pristin Perez. So uh, while nobody's love uh, does not explicitly show provide emphatic signs that is inspired by the world during the pandemic. So uh, there is we the band has said in an interview that it is based on the pandemic. But while I believe that we will win is a clear plea to stay safe and overcome the obstacles caused by COVID-19. So these two music videos received positive reviews primarily from the listeners worldwide. So this is an attempt to investigate the representation of the pandemic and the symbols of hope in the videos and to explore the capacity of these texts as dynamic modes of imaginative articulation. So the narratives that play out in the videos will be analyzed. Also the political undertones and the major issues that go, in ha go hand in hand. Though uh, traditionally con considered as self-contained, the text, as we know, is unlimited and open to interpretations. So it is a lively entity that has a narrator which needs to be tackled by the viewer or listener or the consumer. So uh, Stuart Hall in encoding and decoding in the television discourse suggests that the meanings and messages in the discursive production are systematized through the operation of codes within the framework of language. So the technical code primarily used in the show is in, in this we first video is dissolved. So several uh, scenes in the video end up with a sharp statement as it moves into a different scene. And this signifies the presence of a periodic omission. Uh, so the music video, Nobody's Love, begins by portraying a landscape and it slowly dissolves into an image of Adam Levine, uh, where he is focused in the rest of the video. So this promises um, a level of intimacy throughout the video as it suggests that this is a personal plea, unlike uh, the bombardment of visuals that keeps changing. So he is focused throughout the video and the setting of the video is an open garden at night uh, where the singer uh, sits across a table which has his phone and some other equipment. So a red light is lingered uh, over the singer as he sings about the fear of letting one's loved ones go. 
so the song uses semantic codes that are familiar to the general public and is it's uh, the video it's linear in nature so the use of familiar symbols like a lampshade in a dark background is meant to provide comfort so none of the remains of the pandemic such as um, a mask is shown in the video uh, memory as a diachronic process changes continually over time so the network of links explored in the video are part of the pre pandemic world and can be deemed as an as external in relation to the crisis in question but this very act of sticking to symbols and mottos that only remind us of our covid pre past is to evoke hope and to create a distinction between remembering and forgetting so reality as we know uh, is interpreted when it gets represented so our codes of perception are shaped by our ability to interpret signs so representation bestows identity and this proves the fact that identities can be constructed by negotiation so assertion of a form of love that can hurt even as an adult through the lyrics tries to achieve the status of an invocation uh, that asks us to overcome the obstacles with love so according to the video love imparts hope uh, coming to the second video which is pitbull's video titled i believe that we will win uh, it is also called the world anthem it is a much stronger appeal to fight against the deadly virus so it is very explicit uh, and it, uh, in the symbols are very explicit and it provides an inspiring message to people from all over the world so a section of the lyrics goes like this i quote uh, you know what spreads faster than any virus fear and when it comes to fear you can either forget everything and run or you can face everything and rise and go uh, so the song directly calls for action and motivates the listeners or consumers to face the adversity with courage uh, the revenue made from the song is claimed to be handed over to feeding america and tony robbins foundation uh, which is for covid relief so um, the fast paced song incorporates hundreds of people's and slogans as the focus shifts and goes back to pitbull the rapper so slogans such as face everything and rise and i believe you know these things are used a lot uh, in the video and these are meant to encourage everyone to perform everything they can to get over this era of this contagion so in this video the scenes create a syndactic linear narrative although music videos can be non linear and paradigmatic as well as abstract so all these syndons uh, together structure and create the meaning that we decode from the video ordering the signs in specific ways so pitbull's entry towards the indoor stadium at the beginning represents him as this uh, savior or maybe a demigod like figure and it can be interpreted that he intends to be one with his music so an image as the basic constituent of a film or visual that is highlighted here so the there are numerous elements in an image such as a uh, camera angle lighting props etc which can be varied to obtain a totally different image but here we can see that the rap, image of the rapper is highlighted or foregrounded there is a paradigm behind each of these elements so uh, according to christian metz a theory in uh, a semiotics of the cinema there is another similarity between the image and a sentence so they are that both are actualized units whereas a word is merely a potential unit of code so each of the shorts arise from such elaborate paradigms which are coupled and accumulated since each scene is a combination of a number of images and if you watch the video we can see that a lot of these images come together like uh, the, the the shots keep changing uh so individuals belonging to various national nationalities are presented in the video to characterize the solidarity uh, he either assumes we have or should achieve um everybody is constantly moving to the beats of this highly infectious song so paradigmatic transposition as john fis calls uh, it in introduction to communication studies accounts for the metaphorical relation here a uh, relation here since any metaphor is a displacement of the expected paradigm in a syntax with units from another paradigm 
So in this video, unlike the former, we witnessed clear markers of the pandemic, such as uh, face masks. Other than that, some sequences employ the format of a Zoom meeting, uh, like we have now, uh, to signify the relevance of online platforms in keeping us connected. So the narrator was straightforward and powerful as it moves into a request for action and uh, trust in humanity. So the symbolic chord, according to Roland Barthes, extends beyond the immediate stereotypes to point out something larger. So in the concern text, we perceive how the artist wants us to come together figuratively, not literally, because obviously we have to uh, keep our distance. So the signs that convey the idea that we should be calm and fearless, along with the ones that implore us to fight metaphorically, can be considered as the symbolic chords in the video. Uh, so the two music videos as texts that uh, talk about staying hopeful exert very different strategies. So uh, Theo van Leeuwen uh, in introducing social semiotics states uh, that I quote, in, uh, as in visual modality, there are both degrees and kinds of sound modality. The truth of a given recording will be cued in by the degree to which that recording uses certain means of oral expression, pitch range, narrow versus wide, loudness range, amount of variety in the duration of sounds, amount of variety in the steadiness of sound, for example, degrees of vibrato in music, sound texture, smooth, rough, tense, lax, etc., and so on. There is no space here to explore this in detail, but one point needs to be made, unquote. So both the videos uh, appeal to the general public who are aware of and affected by the pandemic to varying degrees, but they make very different use of these elements. Uh, the second video is explicitly political as it can be considered as an answer to tensions between various uh, countries and how we should overlook that to contend with the pandemic. So human existence makes sense when we try to place actions and emotions with within logical plots. So this representation integrates at uh, some levels the imaginative order and real life and we determine meanings out of it. So both videos, um, I think, try to communicate and spread hope through various devices. They show how media and pop music exercise as powerful tools um, for invigorating an entire generation going through collective trauma and as well as um, health hazards. So I would like to conclude that uh, several signifying elements and technical aspects and uh, their ideological functions as performances exhibit hope in the selected musical videos as a, re a representation of mainstream pop music. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Abhirami, for that uh, really insightful presentation. I hope at the end of the three uh, papers, we will have some time to talk about it. I quite like the way in which you foregrounded the, 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 the different memory ecology that one could uh, see in these uh, music videos. And I quite like the attention to the details which you try to foreground in terms of the presences as well as the absences, paying attention to the way in which the narrative pans out, the nonlinear narrative which also tells the story of the pandemic without really telling it. So perhaps, you know, we will get uh, more time to talk about this at the end of the three sessions. Uh, thank you very much again for sticking to time as well. Uh, so now I invite the next uh, presenter. Um, I request the next presenter to kindly Unmute as well as, uh, you know, make yourself visible if that is possible. Hi, all. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, the next presenter is Parvati, and I request you to start with your presentation. As uh, uh, mentioned earlier, you have 15 minutes to present your work, and maybe at the end of the three sessions, we will have some time to talk about this as well. So, I really look forward to listening to what you have to say. Yes, Parvati. Okay, thank you. Respected panelists, good morning, all. I'm Parvati, and I'm doing my master's in English language and literature. I'm from Kerala. So, 
Uh, my topic concerns to the crucial role of social media during the COVID-19 and to check whether it is an infodemic to the society. So we know that we live in a society which is much advanced technologically, whether in the hands of communication or other technological inventions, we are much more advanced rather than the our ancients. So the uh, and in, in the important fact that occurs in the use of uh, internet, an inevitable search occurred in the usage of uh, internet in the time of 2019, when the whole world was under the massive spread of coronavirus. And the disease of coronavirus, it, as it is called as COVID-19, had marked a pandem, was, it was been marked as a pandemic by the WHO, or the World Health Organization, in the year of 2020. And uh, as its uh, first uh, identification on worse since its first identification, the disease had spread rapidly uh, from countries to countries, from regional, uh, without any boundaries, it had spread all over the world. And each of those nations had imposed strict measures to control the ongoing spreading. As a result, uh, quarantine measures, containment measures, including the strict quarantine, isolations, uh, everything were being taken as a uh, measure, and social distancing was being taken. The measure of reducing social contacts as well as the uh, isolation made uncertainty as well as stress within the people. Even at the time of strict contact, a context had made people to become atrocious. These barriers were broken when people started to communicate with each other through a uh, non-physical medium of interaction, uh, uh, which um, socializes them suddenly and it lead from uh, an offline medium to an online one. So during the time of COVID-19, we have a wide range of internet behaviors on the time of pandemic. So as said before, the technological advancement during the time of this pandemic have helped us to communicate with each other, comparing with that of those uh, early spreading of diseases uh, when comparing it with the Great Plague in the year of 1665 or the flu of eight, 1918. Uh, even during the time of Ebola, large number of people were affected and there were no further uh, good uh, measures to communicate with each other as that of our present time. But lockdown in the time of 2020 made the people to utilize the medium of communication to interconnect with each other. And in other way, we can say that uh, virus changed the way we uh, inter relate to each other or internet and grave concerns were given to the advancement of digital uh, technologies. As it was a, a sudden epidemic, many people were uh, unable to return to their home with this sudden closure. The measures taken uh, to would uh, grab the pandemic resulted in an increased amount of screen time during the time of pandemic and uh, I think it's the only medium that can enable the situation uh, and it will be making us emotionally as well as uh, socially connect with each other in this adversity. As social connection is a fundamental to the people, they look advantage uh, for academic performance as well as on the ground of entertainment. Irrespective of age, uh, people stick to it. So uh, looking closer into the internet behaviors during this time, we have the negative as well as the positive grounds. Uh, one such negative ground, the restriction in the social uh, interaction accelerated the use of digital media. At the inception stage onwards, the people relied more on to the medium to get as many information uh, related to the disease as it's uh, new to the kind of disease. Several internet sites came up with varied level of information, either it may be a false uh, one or it may be rightful. Uh, it made the social media sites an infodemic as a whole because of the circulation of fake news regarding the pandemic. The include the identification of medicine to home remedies and then we also came up with in many kind of false measures being adapted. And this uh, false information were passed uh, through the internet site until a proper means or a, a measure or a proper remedy was being, uh, was being introduced by our authorities. 
the co uh, the uh, one who diagnosed the infections were treated with uh, fear by the people treated with fear by the people as of the fact that this internet sites uh, uh, moves on circulating false information social media sites circulated information about the affected people which described about a route map and number of positive uh, cases in each part even the positive cases in the regional uh, areas were been given with much more important for a short while it has created a kind of tremendous uh, until a proper vaccination remedies were in, invented even after the discovery of vaccine uh, this kind of misleading information passed down to via the social media groups but in uh, its intensity uh, as compared to the initial stages of uh, people giving me information um, were, were in a decrease scale. In this post through digital, uh, digital era, misinformation uh, passes from one source to the next and the masses even without any validity have given worthiness to this information. So apart from this, we have certain physical as well as mental illness which were created as a result of over usage into this media. Researchers have came with the proof that uh, which delineates an excessive or uh, a compulsive, uh, compulsive of digital media, uh, whatever the purpose, it will be having a negative impact to it. As the situation demands isolation rather than socializing, people have an overexposure to this medium sources. And as a result, outdoor uh, exercises or outdoor physical activities were reduced to a lower scale and eventually it dictated a, st uh, a state of uh, myopia or extreme body pain and sleep disturbance in many a number of people and uh, diag um, and even people have diagnosable mental illness such as depression anxiety fear uh, tension stress uh, which is um, undergone by the people during the time of COVID-19 because of the restriction imposed by the authorities. And surveys have proven that the teenagers or children equally have a, a gaming addict and even led to death. In case of adult, during the increased uh, sedentary time, obesity, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, and every other cardiovascular risk factors were in a large number scale. Then, about the positive impact, though uh, we have the negative impact, there are also equal number of positive impacts. Too. Social network during the time of pandemic have the positive impacts like the quarantine or similar isolation period in the initial stages made by the authority have engaged into physical disturbance and those places of merry making or educational institutions cinema halls and every other malls or government as well as private institution for a short period or a long period of time were closed and it raised many kind of psychological instability in many people and to ease this kind of uh, instability or an uncertainty, social media sites provided opportunity. Virtually, people were connected to each other and it changed the way in which we internet. And this long break made the people to identify their real talent and sharing content, promoting and state, starting new pages for publishing once on creativity were enhanced via the net. For a long uh, break, educational institutions were being closed. And now too, we are interconnected with each other through the digital platforms. Rather than communicating with each other through an offline medium, we are con con com communicating with each other through a digital medium. To get into the normal state of physical classroom uh, or physical atmosphere, and nature was una uh, unable to begin on those stages even now so the visual classrooms via google meet or google classroom or zoom meet have made the people to communicate with each other to cluster with each other and to share their ideas um, and from a long break from the um, or offline it have given chances to people to communicate with each other through online platform 
and more than that people were communicating their own emotional balances for example several of old age people were inside their home and they were been uh, not able to say their dear ones for a very long period of time and to advance this period there comes the internet and the uh, shutting down of physical market finds a solution with the opening of online shopping for the government institution social media sites were a great relief why because uh, the fa factual information were passed through their official media sites and to a prolonged extent social media sites accelerated in gathering the people together covid 19 in, in its initial Uh, stages had created a kind of instability in job sectors as well as in a number of other um, areas and people were even unemployed with the opening up of several other contents as well as internet pages uh, social media pages have given opportunities for them to uh, en engage in the job sectors too and there are other vast uh, um, positive as well as negative impacts created as a result of um, covid-19 and at, at levels um, covid-19 is also been regarded as a digital pandemic because of the passing up of information misinformation through this media sites social media so uh, to conclude the section i may add that social media users in the contemporary society has increased in a situation of natural disasters in other crises even in the natural disasters internet where a great uh, internet had played a crucial role during the pandemic period social media functioned as a potential threat as well as um, a medium for amalgamation never before in the history was it easy to communicate faster and share information during the global pandemic social media had accelerated in disseminate information and information regarding new discoveries protocols diagnosis and treatment strategies circulated through the media sources through the, though there were several manipulation Uh, occurring in this information occurred in the usage by certain group their function internet function and the social media sites have uh, the played by the social media sites is highly appreciated and thank you thank you very much parvati and i do think that you know this has a potential uh, it's, it's kind of a paper that you can keep working on because right now we are also in this uh, a uh, transition towards you know coat on coat the normal and uh, now getting back to you know again the coat on coat the normal you would find that would be a greater challenge to fit back to what we were used to for the longest time because you know this uh, the last couple of years there was a major disruption and you also highlighted what i quite liked was you know the positive aspects of this pandemic yes it's very uh, you know it's a very delicate matter to begin to talk about the pandemic and also about the inventiveness that it brought about and uh, what i find very interesting is in both these papers uh, uh, you know now when we talk about media it is by default the digital media because you know the especially the last couple of years did not give us much of uh, other options yeah perhaps you know we will get more time to talk about it and uh, in parvati's paper you know she also spoke about the changes and uncertainty at various levels technological spatial psychological physiological structural and even economic so there's so much packed into this paper which i hope you know later you will be able to uh, you know flesh out into a larger project as well in the times to come then thank you again for sticking to the uh, time and now we have the uh, final paper in this uh, panel from adish the paper titled nationalist rhetoric in the times of pandemic and analysis of narendra modi's uh, speeches during covid-19 crisis So Adish, over to you. I like the other two papers. You have fifteen minutes to present, and uh, at the end of it, we will uh, open up for discussions and questions. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, you are. Thank you, ma'am, and uh, I thank the organizers, uh, also the uh, HSS department of IIT Madras for giving me this opportunity. And my paper is titled. nationalist rhetoric in the times of pandemic and analysis of narendra modi speeches during the covid-19 crisis and i would like to just present it without a powerpoint presentation yeah, absolutely so, uh, adish if i may interrupt you for a minute if it's feasible for you um can i keep the video on for a, just a little bit at least i uh, only if it's yeah, possible so, so. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do that. My my data is not really great, but no, no problem, no problem, no worries there, no worries there. Yeah, only if it okay. is feasible for you. Yeah, right. Go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Please go ahead. Okay. So I would like to start by quoting Anthony Giddens: "Nationalism rises when ordinary life is disrupted." The uh, United Nations has dubbed the COVID-19 pandemic as the largest public global health crisis in a century. The Secretary General declared it as, quote, the greatest test that we have faced since the formation of the United Nations, unquote. The old pervasive pandemic has transformed our political systems as well. It created a state of emergency that equipped the state machinery with the power to make vastly unchallenged decisions on the everyday life of its citizens. With lockdown protocols in effect, state dictated when to cease and resume a normal life. With the help of existing literature on the relationship between crisis and nationalism, many scholars have attempted to analyze and predict the possible effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on nationalism. David Miller concludes his introduction to nationalism, arguing that it is unavoidable in the modern world. A modern phenomenon, it encompasses the feelings of control, belonging, and cooperation while also generating indifference or even hostility towards outsiders. Taking Europe into account, Zhongwan Wang argued that external shocks and crises shape neo-nationalism. Stephen Wald predicted that the pandemic will strengthen the state and reinforce nationalism. Governments of all types will adopt emergency measures to manage the crisis, and many will be loath to relinquish these new powers when the crisis is over. Ivan Krastev also predicted a stronger wave of nationalism in the post-pandemic world. Co Collegin termed this phenomenon coronationalism, while different theorists have observed the tendencies of medical nationalism, vaccine nationalism, and economic nationalism. Herbert Kitschel argued that nationalism, protectionism, anti-migration policies, and anti-regionalism comprise a winning formula of neo-nationalism. Despite what we term it, the nation has acquired stronger powers during the ongoing crisis. Closed borders, restricted migration, nativism, protectionism, and an increased dependency on federal government can be observed across the world. The government of India declared its first complete lockdown for 21 days on March 24, 2020. Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, addressed the nation over multiple press conferences and monkey bath sessions to talk about the crisis and governmental measures. As a leader of the right-wing nationalist government, the Prime Minister's speeches conveyed ideas of nationalism. Most notably, he gave a call to clap, bang vessels, and light lamps as a gesture of solidarity with the health workers, while also urging Indians to make use of Ayurvedic medicines to resist the pandemic and boost immunity. His speeches comprise quotes and references from ancient Hindu texts and Puranas. This paper attempts to analyze the responses and public speeches of PM Narendra Modi to understand the nationalist tendencies in India during the COVID-19 crisis, Indian government and the pandemic. It is important to understand the context of the crisis in the national political sphere. The central government was facing difficulties in handling the protests against its newly passed Citizenship Amendment Act and National Citizenship Registry. Nationwide gatherings, student uprisings, and political rallies were taking place. The iconic Shaheen Bagh protest turned out to be a prime site of resistance for the protesting groups. It swiftly acquired the symbolism of an admirable movement led by women and minorities against the policies of the central government. The COVID-19 crisis presented the government with an opportunity to diverge attention from anti-government protests. The responses from several ministers and the social media outrage on the spread of COVID-19 following the Tablighi Jamaat conference in Delhi rendered a communalist angle to the crisis. There was a call to launch a vaccination campaign on August 15 to tie the fight against pandemic with nationalist sentiments. India's mass production and export of hydroxychloroquine and Covaxin were emphasized by the government as their great contributions to the world to tackle the crisis. But vaccination drive in India was taking place at a slow pace at the time, which invited a lot of criticism. The vaccination certificates drew con controversy over the fact that every one of those had the picture of the Prime Minister. His social media admirers projected the Prime Minister as a sage, an image which was backed by his public appearance with a long beard. He gave a call to follow the path of Lord Sri Ram during the crisis. Narendra Modi was faced with severe criticism on some other grounds as well. When the lockdown measures were in effect, Indian households were fighting hunger. 
hundreds of laborers were traveling on foot for thousands of miles to their natives from metropolitan cities. Even though Prime Minister's call to bang vessels and light lamps was met with a warm response, a part of the media criticized, quote, the illusion of action without commitment, unquote, which involved, quote, exhibitionist celebration of symbolic rituals that did not help the burning cause. It was possible to spot, quote, Hindu chauvinism in India's COVID-19 response. Arogya Sedu, a mobile application launched by the government of India, was criticized for turning surveillance-oriented and breaching the privacy of the citizens. Speaking nationalism during the crisis. The Prime Minister has been criticized for his lack of public addresses and par parliament speeches in the past. During the COVID-19 crisis, his first public address stressed the fact that India reported fewer cases than most countries and that the nation is prepared to face the pandemic. He called for sacrifice from the people in his address that declared an initial 21-day long lockdown. His speeches featured the rhetoric technique pathos or emotional persuasion, notably when he spoke about showing gratitude to the COVID warriors and foregoing social life for the greater good. His appearance, and that was compared with the charismatic image of a sage, can be observed as ethos. He frequently brought in anecdotes and sayings from ancient Indian texts, including Vedas and Puranas. I quote, Mahabharata war won in 18 days, but fight against coronavirus will take 21 days, he said in his address. Quoting from Yajur Veda, he argued that in a war, bravery and discipline are called for. His use of the word Lakshman Rega in the 10th episode of Monkey Bath 2.0 as an analogy for locking oneself up inside the house without attempting to step outside also garnered attention. The effort to compare the ongoing crisis with the great wars in Puranas was evident. Stressing on the importance of Ayurveda and Yoga in boosting immunity and fighting COVID, the next Monkey Bath narrated the story of Pandavas from Mahabharata while also quoting Chanakya. Akni Shesham, Rina Shesham. The 12th edition of Man Ki Baat 2.0 mentioned the idea of Atmanirbhar Bharat, self-reliant India. Every session includes ancient Sanskrit verses that supports his argument. Even though different addresses were responses to different situations, it is possible to identify certain common elements in Prime Minister of India's speeches. There was excessive use of the war analogy and mythological symbolism from the Puranas to address the pandemic. Instead of secular symbolisms, Hindu texts were often quoted to describe a situation. Sanskrit verses, predominantly from ancient Hindu texts, were incorporated into every monkey bath speech. The stress on the idea of war can be understood as an attempt to bring in nationalist sentiments in the fight against the pandemic. It is generally assumed that war as a time of emergencies when a ruler requires unconditional support from his or her people. The projection of COVID as a threat from outside that needs to be fought with courage easily brings patriotism into play. The speeches focused on invoking an emotional response from people by stressing self-sacrifice and gratitude in the times of crisis. The symbolic gesture that involved clapping and banging vessels, lighting diyas, the same kind of lamps that are used for Diwali, a Hindu celebration, was an attempt to consolidate the sentiments of gratitude and turn it into a spectacle. There is also an emphasis on the idea of self-reliance of the nation and its people in speeches. It was also linked with the efficiency of the state in manufacturing vaccines and medicines. The speeches also highlighted the importance of Ayurveda and Yoga, India's two globally renowned contributions to medicine and wellness, and thereby played up the ability of the nation to deal with the crisis. To conclude, I would like to argue that naturally a government expects its citizens to stand together in a crisis. The solidarity can be helpful to improve popular support for the government. The evidently populist government of India, led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, resorted to ideas of nationalism during the crisis. It falls in line with the global political trend that several scholars have already discussed, an increase in nationalist advances during a crisis. Thank you everyone for listening to me. That's Uh, thank you, all three uh, panelists. It was, uh, you know, a series of very connected, but as well as very original kind of discussions. Yeah, and thank you all, first of all, for sticking to the time limit described. And uh, one of the organizers, Garima, could you tell us how much time do we have for uh, wrapping up, along with some discussions and questions, if possible? Um, I believe we have thirty more minutes. 
we have 30 more minutes. Yeah, good. Yeah. So can I request if it's feasible or the, or all the 3 panelists, you know, if your bandwidth and uh, the other circumstances allow you, if you could keep your video on for some time, that would be very, very helpful. And I guess, you know, the ironical fact about the pandemic, uh, the period, the communication during the pandemic period is that there is an influx of, uh, visual material from everywhere, but we just do not see each other. Yeah. And if, even in the, uh, I guess, you know, in these last couple of years, most of us are now used to addressing blank screens. Yeah. So let's, uh, if possible, make an effort where we can keep their videos on just do that. So there is some human presence in this, uh, uh, virtual meeting as well. Yeah. So I really enjoyed all the 3, uh, papers and I will very briefly comment on. Uh, some of the things that I found very pertinent in connecting the threads and also, you know, opens up, uh, uh, you know, much for future research as well. Yeah. So congratulations for entering this, uh, uh, field of, you know, looking at the contagion and, uh, media from very diverse aspects. Yeah. The 1st paper, uh, Abhirami spoke about the popular culture and now, you know, even when it is not spelled out, we can quite see that, you know, the popular culture, the notion of culture that we used to uh, refer to in the pre pandemic world where we, you know, again, we have, we used to, uh, we, we had to bring in popular culture quite forcibly. Sometimes we had to bring in the media culture quite forcibly sometimes to engage with the contemporaneous, but now there is a normativity about it. Yeah. And because, you know, the video that, uh, uh Abhirami, uh, uh, mentioned, you know, especially the 1st, 1, the maroon. Um, it, it, even the technicalities were disrupted. It was, I believe, you know, shot uh, on a smartphone. Yeah. And it was released in YouTube. Yeah. Those were the things which were considered as secondary options in the pre pandemic world. Yeah. So you would also have realized that as and when we are looking at the newer forms of media, the newer forms of popular culture, it's also pushing the limits and challenging the frameworks, which were earlier available uh, from Stuart Hall and from. Uh, you know, Clifford Geats, yeah, when you know, Clifford Geats, uh, when Clifford Geats was talking about culture studies and popular culture, he had to make a case for bringing in cockfighting and talking about that as part of culture. But now we have come to a point where even a video shot in a phone, which is your own personal gadget, yeah, that also has a potential to go out and become something. Uh, 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 you know, uh, massively global. Yeah, so that is the kind of. Uh, 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 traction, that's a kind of paradigm shift that we are looking at. I believe all of you know, also use the term paradigm in different uh, ways. And th there is certainly a paradigm shift that this pandemic has brought in, particularly in the way in which we connect and communicate with each other. And Adish's paper uh, spoke about the political uh, uh, shift, the paradigm shift in the political Scenario, if you think about 20 years before watching news was synonymous to watching TV, it's not the case anymore. Yeah, you do not even need a TV connection. Perhaps, you know, a cable connection to have access to news. Now, the news is something which again arrives to a personal gadget that you have. It can arrive in different formats. Yeah. So 1 of the things that uh, are this paper also. Uh, foregrounded was without, you know, uh, though, you know, now we don't even have to spell out these things. That's a, that's a larger beauty of this as well. 1 of the things that he was drawing attention to was the different formats through which we can access the political articulations. And it's difficult to say which format is more acceptable, which format is more legitimate than the other. There is clearly a breaking down of hierarchy, which was predicted as a utopian thing, perhaps, you know, 30, 40 years back when cultural studies and media studies were emerging as, you know, we're struggling to emerge as proper disciplines. Yeah. So this breaking down of uh, hierarchy, this fluidity across uh, formats. Yeah. If you uh, notice now, we do not have, there was a time when only the kind of news which came out through perhaps, you know, Doordarshan was seen as the most legitimate form of, uh, uh, you know, uh, most legitimate news archive. Those days are gone. Anything which comes up in social media also, like sometimes maybe momentarily, there is a legitimacy which it acquires. And we have come to a point where we do not ask such questions anymore. Yeah. And part of this paper was trying to address the 
how the the uh, the holistically it was trying to address the different shifts you know from technological to the psychological as well as physiological yeah and there are a lot of structural and spatial changes that we see around us you know some of which were uh, you know unimaginable and uh, perhaps you know inconceivable in the pre pandemic world you know i could talk about you know a couple of things within this campus within this iit campus where uh, a community hall which was only used for cultural events you know it had to be converted into a vegetable shop in order to facilitate social distancing yeah so there is a there uh, uh, you know two years back even a proposition like this would have sounded very very jarring yeah and in terms of how we uh, uh you know see different spaces the the even this you know the the virtual meeting that we have one of you also spoke about that you know the markers of uh, pandemic mask zoom meeting yeah so and there's also you know another uh, uh another um uh, quite an interesting as well as alarming thing perhaps you know uh academicians will also begin to address very very soon there is a generation which is growing up which is more tuned to communicating only in the digital phase a generation which has never been to a classroom space before a generation which does not know or the generation which never had to be taught the etiquettes of being in the classroom what you know and now you know you also know that um just like uh in a very very larger sense in terms of media in terms of communication earlier we knew that only are uh, uh, something which was uh telecast through a tv through a channel something which was brought home through these established media forms had an orchestrated frame now even as individuals we are all broadcasting we can show the image we can show the background we can show only the frames that we want to show whether we are at home or at office or attending a meeting from a public space we can choose to frame our background we can choose to tell the stories in the way that we want to present them this wasn't an option in the pre pandemic world you had to be in the classroom and it was you and your personality now there are so many frills that you could add you could even choose not to show yourself and that's entirely fine imagine you know and these are the uh, the the multiple shifts which are also rewiring the way in which we connect rewiring the way in which we think about staying connected yeah so in terms of you know a theoretical model which i am you know trying to uh, uh, think through a couple of models which could perhaps address these collectively uh, some of you might be aware of uh, andrew hoskins yeah he's a uh, he's a uh, uh, you know historian and a theoretician who has been working on memory and media simultaneously and now when we talk about media now when we talk about any forms of connectivity it's impossible not to talk about remembering and forgetting as well you all you know refer to the, that in in you know in very tangential ways uh, uh, you know although in very tangential phase you know you did refer to that and just drawing your attention to that bit um so uh, andrew hoskins talks about this uh, connective turn the connective turn in media uh, where we are also you know uh, looking at a hyper connective media which was never there before yeah and the pandemic has already accentuated that because you know if you think about it there's an obsessive desire there is a almost an obsessive compulsion to stay connected all the time not just in terms of uh, the personal connects but in terms of uh, the larger structural ways as well you know there's a reengineering of technology a reengineering of uh, media because of which there's a reengineering of the way we remember the way we forget as well yeah so in some sense there's a placelessness in this virtuality yeah there's a rootlessness in this virtuality but there is also a uh 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 an almost nightmarish kind of uh, locatedness which was in earlier unimaginable Where, wherever whatever you know you're doing now and especially this is all the more pertinent in the pandemic post pandemic world yeah because we are also doing everything digitally we're always located there's a location which can always be traced and whatever we do in this space every bit of communication it cannot be erased yeah so it's a very hyper connective media with a uh with, with a, you know unprecedented scale of locatedness that we are inhabiting there's nothing which can be erased easily and it's also very difficult to regulate and control so when we are talking about media in the contemporary it's a very different grammar it's a very different uh uh, background for it it's a very different set of rules that one is talking about you do not do not even know that the 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 lines are getting increasingly blurred as well of course there are a lot of positive aspects to it you know there's a liberation from the spatial archive but it also comes with a lot of inherent challenges a lot of inherent uncertainty and this is the uncertainty 
this is the uncertainty you know which we experience on a daily basis as well you know and uh and another thing which i thought you know in terms of the uh, it also makes it increasingly possible for us to juxtapose these different responses. Yeah, that is something which uh, I believe uh, Adi's paper was also trying to do, juxtaposing these different responses. It becomes easier to bring in for, you know, whether, you, whether one agrees with that kind of an articulation or not, whether one agrees with that sort of framing or not, it makes it easier to juxtapose these different uh, aspect these different narratives which are running simultaneously which wasn't possible maybe you know uh, 50 to 70 years before because even at that point of time in terms of the political articulations in terms of the media articulations yeah where there were uh, multiple events and responses happening at the same time you know one of the example quick example that i could think of is the uh, the midnight speech the uh, the tryst with destiny speech the midnight independent speech that nehru gave Around the same time, this um, partition, you know, uh, one of the bloodiest uh, events uh, in modern history was also happening. Yeah. And another thing is, you know, right after the World War, right after the two world wars, yeah, when all nations, all modern nations are picking up from where they left and trying to, uh, you know, make a fresh entry into modernity, into nation making. At the same time, Holocaust is also happening, but it wasn't easier to juxtapose the images, juxtapose the different voices at that time. But this hyper-connective media has also made it possible for us to be able to access these different images, access these different voices, put them all together, whether one could change it or not, whether one agrees with it or not, it's out there, out there for the present generation as well as for the posterity to access, to observe, to critique, to analyze, it's, it's there, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, you don't have to be an archivist to go back and dig up these different voices yeah and because even now like you know uh, and uh, a lot of things have changed even after you worked on these uh, papers now you know you have this uh, um, new mega global event happening the russia ukraine war yeah so there is one more uh global event yeah which is kind of getting superimposed into this pandemic narrative for which to have access to this you don't have to be necessarily a specialized historian you just need to have access to the media which now by default you know it's the access to the internet yeah so all of these things are we are living in an age when media means all of these things simultaneously yeah and media just is not something which is uh, you know, which is located there outside of us, but it is something which can affect us physiologically and psychologically as well. You know, part of this paper did speak about that very briefly in terms of the physiological changes as well. Yeah. And how, you know, I, I mean, there are a lot of other things, of course, you know, you two perhaps wanted to include, but didn't have enough uh, time. You know, the entertainment quotient has uh, changed uh, entirely. Yeah. Very briefly, uh, uh, Abhirami did address that too. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I would also just, you know, quickly open up the floor to more questions. Yeah, I, I do have a couple of questions for all of you as well. Let me um, just see if there are others in the audience who have any comments, observations, or quick questions to the panel. Yes, we have Jayavatare. Yes. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you uh, so much for your uh, enriching inputs that you all have given on such um, innovative topics and thank you ma'am uh, for uh, explaining in detail for uh, adding adding more depth to uh, what has uh, what has already been uh, highlighted earlier so my question is uh, for uh, Abhir, abhirami and uh, like i think ma'am also pointed out and you have also um, uh, you know uh, tried to um, address this but my I, I would still ask for a little more uh, uh, like a, a little more analysis of yours if you uh, you know read into it uh, uh, with regard to the first video where uh, you're talking about nobody's love maroon's maroon fives um, uh, you, you know song so i uh, wanted to know that the uh, the text as you've also said uh, ostensibly does not point to any kind of elements that are associated with the pandemic and uh, and it's it's probably their Instagram Instagram post where they say that it was you know um, it, it was uh, 
uh, composed and created during the pandemic. And uh, you talk about how, uh, and even ma'am said that, you know, it's it's shot on a, a phone and uh, that makes it, uh, that gives it that kind of, um, uh, you know, the product of the times, right? The product of the times when it, it when when the pandemic was there or is, is here. So um, I, I wanted to see if you have read into other semiotic elements and uh, uh, of the video itself, which probably, uh, you know, talk about how it is, um, how it's a perform, like, you know, a performance during the pandemic itself. So if, if you could uh, talk about that. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, the video, as we, as you mentioned, it is something that is born out of such a short span of time. So that is something I think is a direct uh, response to the pandemic. This was very uh, dynamic, and as Ma'am has mentioned, it is it was shot on a smartphone, and I'm sure it didn't take a long time to do that. So this video song might have been uh, written for something else, but they do. It is only mentioned that it is a response to the pandemic in an Instagram post or in and also in an interview like you mentioned so uh, I think this is connecting these two events uh, is different but um, the very fact that this is a very short video and uh, there is no scene change it is it focuses on Adam Levine throughout and um, it is at night and you know like I had mentioned there are certain symbols of uh, that comfort us like the lampshade at night so these are things that happen quickly and uh, that I think is a response to the pandemic or how swiftly it can be done because we don't have time to process it everybody is processing it at the same time so yes thank you thank you ma'am yeah thank you for the question and thank you abarami for your response yeah. do we uh have any other questions observations or comments from the audience right uh, so I was wondering, this is a very open uh, ended kind of a question to all three of you. You can, uh, uh, you know, respond to it as you deem fit. Yeah. So, uh, we do realize that, uh, and 1 of you also spoke about the idea of encoding. Yeah. And we do realize that the codes of these different articulations, these different spaces have been changing. Yeah. And now, you know, we are in a position to look back and see how some of these codes very palpably, very tangibly changed during this, you know, right from the early 2020 onwards when this transition was happening. So I'm, uh, I'm just wondering if you would like to, uh, in the light of uh, the specific context of your papers, would you like to, you know, comment on how you think the codes of, you know, it could be the codes of uh, popular culture, yeah, the, the modes of decoding and encoding, yeah, encoding and decoding, yeah, how the codes of popular culture, how the codes of, you know, behavior, and now we even, you know, uh, uh, Parvati used this, uh, 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 this phrase, you know, internet behavior, yeah, so there is an internet behavior, a social behavior, yeah, so how the codes of a behavior and the codes of political uh, articulations, the political uh, um, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, just the political presences and absences. Yeah. So would you like to comment on this shift, you know, as and when, you know, we are living through this uh, transition period and, and it almost seems like, you know, uh, every phase of this, uh, pandemic, it's a transition phase. We are have not yet reached that point where we can say the post contagion phase, yeah, the post pandemic, yeah, we haven't yet reached there. So in the light, in the context of the specific aspects that your papers looked at, and also in the, you know, in the larger context of the contagion, the contagion of not just the virus, you know, you must have, you know, in the course of the last couple of days, spoken about various forms of contagion. So how do you see this, these codes, as well as a process of encoding and decoding uh, changing. Yeah, for instance, you know, uh, to give a quick, uh, very crude, uh, a simple example, like, you know, you see a mask, yeah, and there is a particular way in which the mask can be read. The absence of a mark can also be a fear factor, yeah, the presence of a certain kind of a mask or, you know, having masks of different designer kinds, you know, trying to sell a different sort of a narrative, yeah. So, uh, would you like to, you know, comment on this, yeah? I'm not looking for a structured uh, you know, response, but something which would also help you as well as, you know, all of us to think forward, think ahead 
and in the uh, in the larger context. Yes, Abhirami, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, like you had mentioned, mask, uh, the use of masks as a uh, coded or something that is featured in both the videos that I've talked about, because uh, in, in the first video, it is not present. And but we can see that the singer isolates himself, but uh, we we can directly respond to that. And in the second one, we see a lot of people so from different communities, uh, you know, wearing masks. So that is something that ties them together. It is not something we were used to before the pandemic. So that is a clear cut. Uh, a difference but um other than that something i think in the context of my presentation uh the conversations regarding mental health it is something in the internet age it is becoming um so uh, it, the taboo uh you know surrounding that it's it's slowly lifting people are more comfortable talking about uh the mental health you know post not Post pandemic, but uh, in, in the couple uh, recent couple of years, right. we have seen right. that uh, in the digital age, people are more comfortable. Maybe it is, uh, it can be due to the uh, anonymity that it offers. It is, uh, we can wear a mask. We don't know who we can present ourselves as someone else, or we are more comfortable talking to strangers, or you know the location that we have. Um, it is thus we can also dupe that in a sense. But uh, that a lot of conversations uh, regarding our. Uh, uh, mental health uh, and this uh, systematic study of that and we can even say that uh, this is a mental health pandemic uh, a lot of people are struggling but they are also ready to ask for help more and more so i think that's a change that this particular era brought about right yeah uh, that, that's uh, you know very 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 pertinent you know i quite like the way in which you brought in uh uh, one of the pressing psychological issues of these times and linked it with, uh, you know, this discussion on popular culture. And we do see that, you know, in that uh, light, a lot of boundaries are getting blurred. It's not like, you know, I mean, uh, entertainers can talk about this and politicians can talk about that in this breaking down of boundaries and this blurring of uh, uh, these uh, boundaries and the almost you know a negation of a hierarchy is happening over here that's also you know i mean of course there are a lot of challenges that we may have to um, you know address as well but given that you know in the um, the positive thing is that it does give us some room to talk about these otherwise very very diverse and very very disconnected things yeah to talk about things which could otherwise not be brought in uh, together yeah so I wish you all the very best, uh, Parvati, uh, Abhirami, in your research ahead. I hope you know you'll be able to uh, flesh this out in your full-fledged paper as well. Yeah. And Parvati, would you like to respond quickly? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Okay, ma'am. Okay. So the coronavirus disease of it's of a first kind of the disease relating to that um, global pandemic crisis. So besides the rising number of casualties, what rises in the pub general public is that the uncertainty um, rises in the situation. And there, uh, the social media sites, when talking uh, from my content, I can say, um, say it that um, the internet sites had opened up new spaces and the spaces were being utilized by different number of people in a different uh, manners. And uh, uh, the uh, technological advancement in the modern era have uh, made the people to comment upon anything in their own opinions. And they are the, uh, they made it in a sub, uh, what, subjective way more than uh, what uh, the content they have utilized to uh, comment upon anything in their subjective notion. If they hate something, they usually uh, say it in, a, in the with a bias. And here upon uh, the situation as it is a new of its kind, a number of people came up with their own subjective ideologies. And uh, uh, so, I think that uh, the wider amount of conspiracy theories and the plethora of information being passed through this internet sources were being um, utilized by the people in a different manner and the way we access it is in a different way. For example, WhatsApp is, is such a media source and here when we, uh, when we use as a particular emoji, uh, the one who receives it, it is being uh, reading it in another way around. 
So uh, it's a two median source and we doesn't have any um, connection with each other, the spatial expression or anything. The physical, the physicality, we lacks that physical natural contact. And rather we are being bound, uh, connected with each other only through the screen. And uh, the what expression or the background which I now have, uh, the, I can made it on uh, my own way to be uh, found to you all. For example, uh, I all, uh, my screen uh, uh, is visible to you all and the uh, place which I am now sitting is unknown to you all. So uh, the same situation arises in the COVID state too. Uh, people from different part of the world have uh, given misinformation um, bounding to their own subjective natures and they have actually made the corona situation situation to their own hands um, and that I think uh, the social relationship that we have in the pre-corona period uh, cannot be actually con uh, connected in such a way through the um, uh, ongoing situation of the COVID-19. I think that's it. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Parvati. I was also thinking, as you mentioned, uh, WhatsApp. Yeah? Uh, and I am personally also in terms of my academic interests, I am heavily interested in looking at the connection between history and uh, memory, how our brain, how our social behavior is, has always been rewired based on, you know, how the uh, interfaces of technology, you know, um, uh, intervene on a daily basis in the way we connect with each other. You know, if you think about the history of communication, the history of media, especially the one to one communication we had, you know, uh, there was a time when a person had to deliver a message and then, you know, we had the postal service, yeah, which expanded into telegrams of different kinds. You have a telephone, which made instant communication possible. And with internet, what we uh, also had was it was always a two way communication earlier too, but with the time lag, but this time lag is increasingly reducing with an email you had to, you know, wait for the other person to read it and respond. And with WhatsApp, there's an added complication here. Sometimes, you know, it also becomes a very uh, psychological uh, uh, thing, intervening with the modes of communication. The person has seen the message but hasn't responded, yeah? So you double think for the other person to even before. The two-way communication becomes complex and sometimes very complicated. There are, this is, you know, WhatsApp is a wonderful medium for communication, for quicker communication. Sometimes, you know, the time lag can affect the uh, in, in email communication. But here, you know, all of those problems are erased, but we have newer things to deal with. But of course, you know, that's the way human civilization has been evolving. You have newer kinds of technology because of which the way you remember, the way you forget, the way you respond, everything is uh, rewired, yeah? And uh, that also, you know, helps us to, um, uh, say, reframe, reconfigure our social behavior, our social codes, yeah? So uh, because largely, you know, the journey of human civilization is also about, you know, trying to fit in and survive and go on to the next uh, uh, mode, yeah? So, uh, so th thank you for, you know, addressing a range of things. I hope, you know, this is something uh, in terms of your research interest, Parvati, that you would be able to sustain this interest and see how you would, I would be very keen to know how we would look back at this phase, maybe, you know, after another 12 to 14 months and evaluate the codes of social behavior again. Yeah. So thank you very much again. Uh, Adish, would you like to pitch in with your response as well? Yeah, ma'am. So yes. yeah, so the question is about codes. I have actually validated a code. I haven't introduced myself uh, in the beginning of my paper. My name is Adish. I'm a research scholar in English from NIT Calicut. So to answer the question, uh, I think my paper had uh, some of the answers because the, the, the whole uh, response is the the entire set of responses from different uh, leaders across the world was of course a play of symbols it it, it had a lot of semiotics semiotics involved uh, as uh, as everyone knows and uh, for example leaders like say bolsonaro and modi they were responding to this this pandemic in some sort of a denial mode first of all they were denying that there would be this sort of a catastrophe also, they were arguing that this is Chinese virus, the terming itself. This is China virus, Chinese virus, the terming itself, it had its own politics. Uh, in India, the, the symbolism that I have mentioned in the paper, the, the, uh, the beard that Modi had, 
also the call for this uh, this gesture of banging vessels and clapping all this had certain codes involved i believe and uh, during the pandemic they acquired some 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 other meaning the the symbolism of war the symbolism of uh, a modern sri ram trying to protect india or a, a modern evil falling upon india all these uh, the evocation of such mythologies all these had its own role in uh, the the um, the handling of the covid and the responses of the people so uh, we would be otherwise critical of government policies uh, during a normal time if there is any such a time but during the pandemic of course uh, whatever the government was proposing uh, there were limitations we could not respond uh, as we wanted we could not protest as we wanted what we had to do was kind of obey those protocols and to an extent it was justified but then uh, reading it uh, in light of this ongoing crisis uh, as, as 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 research scholars i think we all need to look at it in critical ways and uh, thank you organizers again for this opportunity thank you ma'am thank you all for responding very pertinently to uh, you know the, the questions and uh, mine was a very open ended uh, question but i think you know you all have shown how uh, you know the, the the clarity with which you conceived this paper and the way forward is pretty much clear too. And I do agree with Adesh. Like you know, he said at the um, uh, you know the course of his paper as well as now in terms of there are certain kinds of uh, uh, codes and certain kinds of protocols which are still there even when you think you know everything is breaking down. And I also you know just to uh, uh, you know, take half a minute to comment on how. Uh, at the beginning of every session, perhaps, you know, Garima or uh, somebody else must have been doing it. There are certain there are lists of things, the do's and don'ts, yeah, which are part of this uh, uh, formal meeting. Two years back, I tell you, you know, when we have had the first online conference like this, we didn't know what, where, those we didn't know how we didn't have the vocabulary to articulate those codes of behavior as and when the uh, issues were coming up after every session we were noting down the issues and you know uh, uh, making it part of the next set of announcements you know this behavior is not fine you have to stay muted it's do this and you know, don't comment like this and uh, we also realized that in that process by the time the second uh, round of sessions were happening we also knew how to control the space yeah so this is something which will also evolve very organically whichever the space it is whether it's a physical space or a virtual space the codes of behavior the modes of regulation and control because we are hardwired that way in terms of we think about in all kinds of systems through which human beings have uh, evolved yeah through which we've been emerging and uh, you know growing as uh, better people yeah so we, we we realized that you know the 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 codes are something which are always created by human beings it will always stay that way whether you know we are dealing in a physical space or virtual space yeah because the ones who are fundamentally regulating accessing controlling it's a human uh, brain you know it is uh, 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 we, we we would figure out a way to bring things under our control and that's how you know uh, the human systems the establishments have always been working i really enjoyed uh, listening to your uh, papers and i'll also share take another half a minute to share uh, you know something which is part of an ongoing work here at iit we have a center for memory studies and one of the things that we are now looking at is the aspect of forgetting for the longest time, uh, particularly, you know, from the 70s onwards, a lot of academic technological uh, uh, interest, archival interest was invested into trying to understand what was forgotten, yeah, bringing back things and, you know, uh, the right to remember, the right to be remembered. But now with this uh, influx of media, with this different forms of digital memory almost invading our spaces, we are also like you know, beginning to wonder is shouldn't there also be a right to forget and a right to be forgotten you know it could be a social media post it could be something which just went uh, viral it could be a video that somebody clicked of somebody and who nobody knows you know how everyone has access to it yeah so maybe you know in terms of remembering and forgetting in terms of the media dynamics in terms of the different aspects of representation we might very soon reach a point where you know the theoretical framings would also be about the right to forget and the right to be forgotten already in terms of you know in the, the medical history this is you know there's a richer history over there which you know when people cannot forget yeah 
it becomes a problem, you know, and uh, memory was seen as something, uh, the memory was seen as a positive thing and forgetting was always seen as, you know, the other side of the coin, something very negative, but uh, you know, history has been teaching us and perhaps, you know, we will learn more of those lessons in the coming uh, years, in the coming decades where this influx is also posing a problem, which is not allowing us to erase, not allowing us to forget. Yeah, there are multiple things coming in, which is an equally difficult problem, like not being able to remember or not being remembered within any frameworks. Yeah, so on that note, I will uh, call this uh, day. I'll wrap up this uh, discussion. Thank you uh, to all three presenters and to the organizers and to the audience. Our Great lunch on a normal, you know, situation. We would have had lunch here in uh, one of these, uh, uh, you know, guest houses or one of the centers uh, over here. Yeah. So hopefully, when things open up, you all will be able to attend this in person. And we look forward to meeting you all and following you uh, up on your research endeavors. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Marin Simiraj and the panelists for that very enriching session. Uh, the final keynote lecture for this conference by Professor Similar Selvi will begin after a break at 1 p.m. Okay, and stay safe. Bye. Thank you, ma'am.